Hey everyone, want to welcome you here today. Uh, my name's Andrea Krauss. I'm the Community Development Manager at Zeitgeist. Um, we are recording this session today and it will be available online for 30 days after this event. Uh, on the screen, you can see a list of the many sponsors and partners that we have um, making Winter Bike Week possible. Um, before we get too into that though, at Zeitgeist, we like to open our gatherings by taking a moment to collectively acknowledge that Zeitgeist in the area that we call the Twin Ports is built on land that was originally Anishinaabe a king and is home to the Anishinaabe, the original stewards of this territory. The land was ceded by the Anishinaabe in the 1854 Treaty of La Pointe and his historically and today holds a great significance for indigenous people. We're committed to uplifting the name of these lands and the community members from the nations who reside alongside of us. While this land acknowledgement is not enough in itself, it is an important social justice and decolonizing practice that promotes a change in the way of seeing that many of us are visitors and settlers on indigenous land. So, Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, again, my name is Andrea and I'm here with Zeitgeist hosting Winter Bike Week. This is Winter Bliss, dressing for safety and comfort and in the winter with Julie O'Connor. And it's the first of our Winter Bike Week virtual events. Uh, our, our Winter Bike Week is a week of uh, community-led events to celebrate, educate, and empower accessible people-powered modes for getting around the Twin Ports and winter activity now and into the future. In addition to today's presentation, we are also hosting virtual and in-person events throughout the week, including a presentation by Duluth Parks and Rec on recreational programming and equipment available to members of the community. That's Tuesday night and an in-person virtual or virtual session by the Mind Body Trauma Care Lab at UMD to explore mind body practices and movements to cultivate warmth and connection, whatever your mode of winter transportation may be. That's Wednesday evening. Friday is a winter improv at Renegade Comedy Theater. Um, and all through the week are Winter Bike Week specials at the Zeitgeist Restaurant. Uh, and next weekend is a guided walk through downtown Duluth to learn about the history and creation of the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial from Heidi Bach Hansen, a local historian, as well as a walk and presentation uh, through the Chief Buffalo Mural, which was painted last summer uh, with Indigenous mural artist Mary Villiard. So all the details to this can be uh, this and many other events can be found on our webpage, which is in the chat. Um, that's wbw2022.com, stands for Winter Bike Week. Um, plus, anyone who's registered for these events is entered into a drawing to be held at the end of our week for some fun prizes from our event sponsors and partners. So not only could you win free e-bike rentals from e-bike Duluth, um, gear and gift certificates from Aerostitch, uh, bike lights and bags from Continental Bike and Ski, but you get to join in the fun, connect with your community, and hopefully learn a little bit from local experts. You're all probably pretty familiar with online platforms at this point, but I'll just ask that you remain muted. Um, if you do have questions, uh, feel free. Julie has said she's comfortable with questions throughout the presentation, so do feel free to ask those as they come up or enter them into the chat box and we'll make sure they get answered. Um, you're welcome to leave your cameras on. We love seeing your face, uh, but feel free to turn it off if you need to also. Um, take care of yourself during the session if you need to get up and get something to drink or take care of uh, someone in your household, please feel free to do that. We just ask you keep yourself muted maybe turn your camera off if you're walking away from your camera. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter. Today we're joined by an outdoor winter enthusiast who has dedicated 
many of her working hours and probably some of her personal hours to helping people <laughs> stay active, comfortable, and safe outdoors. Julie O'Connor has been providing environmental education to the community and to help us engage with our world more safely and comfortably in all seasons. So it's our pleasure to have her present today as part of Winter Bike Week. Thank you so much, Julie, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. And I just want to say if um, once I start sharing my screen, my nine picture frames are going to just turn into a little film strip on the side. So if you have a question and I don't notice you right away, unmute yourself and, and hop in. It's OK. You can interrupt me. I'm, I'm well used to that. I used to teach fourth grade um, kids at Hawk Ridge, so <laughs> I'm used to all kinds of shenanigans. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and give you a little bit of backstory about me. Um, I was raised by school teachers and my parents lived in Alaska until I was 10 years old. And so we came to Minnesota for the summers where our family was and spent our um, school years in Alaska. And so that um, the remote areas of Alaska don't lend themselves to indoor living. There was no TV, there was one radio station and we only had a few records to listen to. We had lots of books but we spent a lot of time outdoors. My dad's favorite thing in the world is building ice rinks and teaching people how to skate. So I started going outside in the winter time in temperatures well below zero by age two. Um, and my parents just, you know, bundled me up, wrapped me up real tight and sent me out with my dad. And um, I just kind of got used to doing it. I thought that that's how you lived. And after we moved back to Minnesota, when I was 10, we continued playing hockey. We had a hobby farm. We lived, you know, did a lot of outdoor living, um, skiing, skating, exploring in the winter. And um, after I started having children uh, in my 20s, I got involved in dog sled racing. And that was when I learned that some of this generational knowledge that I had included some generational misinformation about how to stay warm or how to dress in the cold. And so I would be on dog sled races and I'd look around and I would see that some people were clearly very comfortable. And I was at that point in time, not all that comfortable. I was having a good time, but I was really uncomfortable. And um, so I kind of attached myself to the people who seemed to know things that I didn't know and um, started learning from them and putting into practice the things that they were telling me about how to stay warm and comfortable um, in extended exposure to cold temperatures. And during, you know, back then the bear race was four or five days long. Um, it was a 500 mile race. And so I would leave home on Sunday and come home on Thursday or Friday and be outdoors for most of that time and really worked out some systems that worked well for me to stay warm for long periods of time. I have a degree in environmental education, which opened the door for me to do some winter camping, some wilderness travel um, in as both a student and an educator and a guide. And um, I also worked for many years at, with the Blackwoods group in town. And so I had quite a history of hospitality, um, event planning. And so in 2017, this weird mishmash of education, outdoor travel, wilderness, winter camping, dog sledding, and hospitality came together into a great opportunity for me. I was invited to help guide a group of nine Chinese tourists down 500 miles of the Iditarod Trail by dog team. And so I was in charge of the hospitality and setting up the camp and the food and taking care of our clients' comfort and safety. Um, and got to travel along. We were on the trail for about 16 days. So it was kind of this funny Venn diagram of my life with all my random scattered experience that came together to all be necessary for this one really grand adventure. So uh, I spend a lot of time outdoors. I ride horses um, and hence I'm all bundled up today. I've been outside for three days at a, at a horse training seminar, learning how to be a better horse trainer. And so I have some chill in my bones because now it's warmer and the humidity is coming up and I'm getting cold. So I'm really excited to share this with, with you. I hate to see people uncomfortable and cold 
when they don't need to be. And so there's some pretty simple techniques and tricks that we can use to, um, to manage cold. And we'll talk about some of those today. Um, so to start off with, we're just kind of going to march through my outline a little bit. First, we're going to talk about some truths and laws in cold management. We're going to talk about our human bodies and how, how, our, how our bodies work a little bit and how that can contribute to us being too warm or too cold. Uh, different materials, details of dressing. Um, we're, we'll talk about layering and how to layer effectively because you can layer ineffectively and make yourself worse off in the long run. Um, adapting to the different conditions, then we'll kind of touch on where to shop so that you don't have to spend a fortune to be well equipped for uh, winter. <clears throat> All right, truths versus laws. Truths I consider to be what usually is the case. Um, stuff that you can pretty, pretty reliably count on, but laws are the things that are always the case. And so there's a couple foundational concepts that will, that you'll hear as a repeating theme through this. One is that moisture is our enemy. Uh, moisture in your clothing, moisture on your skin conducts, uh, heat away from your body through evaporation. Um, and also it can, it, it's, it makes a greater vehicle for cold to travel to your body. So if you think about, you know, when, if you've ever had a, you know, cold, damp shirt or your, when your jeans get wet, it takes so long to dry and they're just cold and awful or putting on a wet swimming suit, you know, a day later, it's awful. It's cold and clammy. And that's just that, that relationship between moisture and cold. Another law that is always true is that air is what keeps us warm. So within our clothing, the more air we can have up against our body, that layer of warm, dry um, space is what is actually helping us insulate. So if you think about the insulation in your walls, there's a lot of air in there. It's not the material necessarily that's keeping you warm. Uh, it, it's the fact that it's got a lot of air and a lot of pile to it that, that helps maintain a layer of warm, dry air uh, between you and the cold. So it disrupts conduction. It also traps heat inside your body. And another thing that is always true is it is always easier to stay warm than to get warm once you're chilled. Um, so with a little bit of planning, we can be safe and comfortable uh, as we venture out, and especially if we're going to be out for any extended periods of time. So our human body, we generate heat from within ourselves. And so our hands and feet stay warm because our warm blood is traveling to them. And so our circulation is what is, we want to keep that in mind as we're talking about managing our cold. So if you're wearing clothing that is too tight and constricting any, any flow of blood into your capillaries and your extremities, you're compromising the ability for that to stay warm. Now, I do need to add a caveat in here. There are people with metabolic issues. There are people with circulatory issues. And the things that we're going to talk about today don't make those go away. Now they can help you manage them. They can help you stay more comfortable than you would be if you didn't employ these measures. But I'm not putting any kind of a guarantee that you're gonna be warm all the time. <laughs> but you'll be warmer and you'll be safer than if you don't, if you're if you're not employing some of these strategies. So when you think about the clothing that you wear, um, you know, these new leggings that are out, you know, that people are wearing all the time. They're great material, but they're really tight a lot of times, and they are impacting those outer layers of circulation of, of the capillaries, um, you know, that are being constricted a little bit by that tighter fabric. So when you are thinking about your long underwear, the looser you can wear it, now you can get to an extreme, but if, you're, if your long underwear can move freely about your skin, over your skin, but also under your clothing, that's going to allow for this layer of air and it's going to allow for your circulation to be unimpeded. A lot of people think that because they're cold, they're not perspiring. And we are always perspiring. We are always creating moisture. And 
moisture is our enemy. So our bodies are always putting a little bit of moisture out into our clothing. So I'm at, at the barn this weekend, every day at noon, everybody's changing their socks because even though we're not sweaty, our socks are getting damp inside our boots. And that damp sock, even if it's wool, is colder than a dry sock. So understanding and accepting the fact that even if you're cold, you are making moisture. Even if you're not sweaty, you're sweating. So accepting those two truths uh, that you are making moisture and that you need free flowing circulation is a really two critical elements in how you manage your clothing. The things that we put into our body can influence our, our overall temperature. So foods that are high in carbs and fats and sugar give you fast burning fuel that can actually generate heat that you may eat, notice and feel. So I tend not to eat a ton of sugar, but for example, this weekend, I've been in a cool, chilly environment for days and I'm drinking tons of Russian tea, which is that tang sugar I, uh, instant tea mix <laughs> with cinnamon in it that is hot and sugary. And that I don't, I don't think about the calories and I don't think of the sugar content because I am looking for fast burning fuel that is creating um, a, a lot of internal heat inside my body. Um, there is a caveat to hot beverages. They can, um, they can interfere with your body's perception of your core temperature. So you want to be just a little bit mindful about that. Of course, you can burn yourself with it. Um, but the other thing to consider is that a lot of people think, you know, have some whiskey because it burns going down. Um, alcohol does two things. One is it dilates your capillaries, which then is going to allow for more blood flow, but that's also going to expose you to more heat loss as you, as your capillaries uh, dilate. Also, alcohol impairs our judgment. And so we can get into doing riskier things or making poorer choices if we have some alcohol on board when we're out of doors for an extended period of time. So just a couple of things to think about, you know, a hot toddy might sound like a good idea, but maybe, maybe just what? <laughs> uh, managing, making sure that we're not getting to the point where we're making poor decisions. Um, how many of us grew up hearing that you lose 80%, you lose 40%, you lose 75% of your body heat through your head? Well, there is a little bit of truth to that. You have a lot of capillaries and a lot of blood flow to your skull. And so we do lose body, a lot of body heat through our skull because we have uh, exposed uh, skin or exposed body part that has lots of capillaries in it and lots of blood flow to it. So we do lose some body heat through our head, but really we don't lose more body heat through our head than we would through any other area of exposed skin on our body. So it's a little bit of a misconception, but it is a good reason to wear a hat because you are trapping heat in uh, up against your body when you wear a hat. Um, and layering, a lot of people will say, oh, I've got seven layers. I've got on two sweaters and three hoodies and I'm freezing. Well, part of the problem is that they are wearing poor quality layers. Maybe they're wearing fabrics that don't lend themselves to retaining heat, but also they may have on so many layers that their jackets tight and cutting off circulation to their arms or that they're um, impacting that flow of, of blood out to their extremities. So we'll talk later about um, the less is more effect of uh, deliberate and intentional layering so that we're not just putting on more clothing. The other piece of layering is that when you get chilled, the um, kind of the, the reptilian survival part of our brain to, you know, hunker down, huddle up when really sometimes the best thing you can do is get your outer layers off 
especially if you are in a warm environment. So people will at the barn, for example, they'll be out in the arena, they'll be out of doors doing activities, getting chilled, and then they come into where it's warm and they stay bundled up, retaining moisture in their inner layers, retaining cold air in the layers of their outer clothing. And then when they go back out, they're twice as cold because they've created more perspiration that's gotten into their clothing. And then when they step back out into that chilly environment, they're, they're much colder than they would be. So it's counterintuitive when you're cold to come into a room and pull off your layers or maybe change a couple of layers because you want to stay covered up and bundled and cozy. But really, if you stop, get warm air into all of your layers and change into some dry clothing, that's going to help you out a lot more than just staying hunkered down and bundled up. Do we have any questions so far? Any myths that you grew up with that you want us you want to address? <laughs> All right, I can move on here. All right, so we have different kinds of materials, different kinds of clothing that we can take advantage of knowledge of to uh, maximize our heat retention. Clothing. Fabric is either hydrophobic or hydrophilic. So hydrophobic means it repels water, it will wick water and moisture away. It doesn't want to be wet. Hydrophilic means it absorbs water or it holds on to water. So you'll hear the, um, the term cotton kills, and that is because cotton is hydrophilic. It wants to hang on to water. This is why we make towels out of cotton, because it sucks up the water and holds on to it. Um, when it comes to winter dress, cotton is an enemy. We don't want to wear any cotton materials out of doors. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, you can't wear cotton in your home, but if you're going to be outdoors for any period of time, I would highly recommend that you um, just avoid all cotton. When I was on the Iditarod, I went out and I bought all new underclothing uh, so that I didn't even have underwear that had any cotton in it because that's of course going to be closest to your skin and absorbing moisture and holding on to it and then there's really no point in all those other layers if your innermost layer is cold and damp. Natural fibers, wool, silk, leather, fur, tend to be hydrophobic. Um, wool is fantastic. It insulates even when it's wet. And so <clears throat> that's, um, uh, I don't recommend wearing wet wool, <laughs> but if you're gonna be in an environment where you can't avoid getting wet, you wanna make sure that you've got wool layers because that will protect you even when it is damp and wet. Um, cotton of course is a natural fiber, but it is hydrophilic down is kind of this weird hybrid. It's hydrophilic, but when it's dry, it holds so much loft and, and air that it provides this nice big puffy layer between you and the outdoor world, the outside world. So um, if your outdoor activity includes high activity and extended period of time, down is fantastic but don't have it be your only layer. Uh, once it gets wet, you're in trouble and it, it turns just to nothing. Um, and it can cause, it can cause some really dangerous situations. If all you have is a down jacket that has gotten wet either through sweat or through outdoor or, you know, external moisture coming in. Um, so for, Long underwear, I am a huge advocate of silk and uh, the real, real lightweight wool blends. They will keep a layer of warm, dry air up against your skin. Because they are hydrophobic, they wick any moisture that's coming off of your body um, out into your outer layers where it can evaporate or maybe it'll freeze on the outside of a sweater and you can just brush it off. Um, that that's a fantastic material for um, your innermost layer. 
I joke about the fact that I wear silk long underwear from October 15th to April 15th, whether I need it or not. <laughs> not the same pair. I have multiple pairs, but uh, I basically put it on because it's it's not retaining a lot of heat. And so you can wear it indoors and be very comfortable and not it's not going to make you real hot and sweaty uh, because it is so thin and lightweight. It's very comfortable under your clothing. It's you know, free flow, free movement inside your clothing. But when you go outside, your jeans are not touching your skin directly. And so it maintains a little bit of that layer of, of heat inside your jeans. Uh, Man-made fibers, there's a ton of them. Um, and, you know, every year there's new um, trademarked, registered trademark brands that are coming out that are made of synthetics, which tend to be hydrophobic and they will wick water really well. Um, it, but not all synthetics are created equal. And so some synthetics tend to have, be more hollow. So they hold more air within them. Some synthetics are, you know, like if you think of a real thick polar fleece, there's, there's a lot of synthetic there, but it's really expanded. And so it's got a thick layer of air in that fleece. That's what's keeping us warm. That's why polar fleece is so warm is because it's got this big thick pile to it and it doesn't hold moisture. So it stays dry against your skin. Um, polyester, nylon, polar fleece, polypropylene, holofill, Gore-Tex, Ultrex, Suplex. There's all kinds of materials out there. They may be expensive and they may sound really fancy, but keep this in mind, if it is polyester or nylon and it's real thin and real smooth, it probably doesn't have much insulating value. It may wick moisture away from your body, but it doesn't have any insulation because there's no air in it. Also, and I'm going to talk to you about this. I'm going to say this several times. If something promises to keep you dry, it will also keep you wet. So if it's going to keep all the water out from the outside, it's also going to retain the water from the inside. And so some of these tech fi fabrics that say that they're breathable, breathable waterproof, I don't wear those outside when I'm active. Ice fishing? Yes. Any kind of movement? No, <laughs> because what they are is basically an, imper an impermeable barrier, like they'll have some rubber in there filled with tiny little pinholes that allows your body heat and body moisture to get out. I don't find that they breathe fast enough or they don't, they don't allow that out faster than we produce it if we're active at all. And so you can then end up with a, basically a rubber barrier holding all of your body moisture in and just soaking your inner layers. So I, I, really shy away from tech gear that promises waterproof, unless it's raining, obviously. Um, but anything that's going to let your, or that's going to keep moisture out is going to hold moisture in as well. The last point on fabrics is no matter what your fabric is, keep it clean. And I don't mean don't wear anything good to the barn because it might get dirty or don't wear anything, you know, out camping because you might get soot on it. I mean, have it clean, you know, between activities. Um, your sweat, your body oil gets into those fabrics and it, and it does compress them. It does give them a, sense, a feeling of a little bit of moisture. It does in, interfere with their ability to um, hold air in, in, up against your skin. So um, you know, I wash my long underwear at least once a month. I'm just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that innermost layer is really important to keep that nice and clean and dry. Um, you know, and here in this weekend where we're outdoors for days on end, where everybody's got different socks that they're putting on and everybody's running home and hand washing wool socks in the sink so that tomorrow they're the cleanest, fluffiest that they can be. So, um, keeping your body oil out of clothing is really an important thing to consider.
Julie, there was yeah. a question in the chat and you, you kind okay. of touched on it, but somebody asked about um, wool keeping you warm, even when it's wet. Can you just say a little bit more about that? And you also referenced that you have been changing your socks, every, you know, during the day while you've had breaks. Um, yeah, yeah. So wool is better than other fabrics at keeping us at, at retaining heat when it's wet. Um, but it's still better to be dry. And I think, I think it's the nature of the fibers. I don't know why I don't, I can't give you the scientific explanation for why that's true. Um, if most wool fiber has some hollowness to it, I should probably get the answer to that, but, um, I'm not positive what, what the reason is for it, but given a choice of damp wool socks or dry wool socks, I'll take dry because <laughs> the dry is still going to be warmer than the damp. So any follow-up questions to that? Okay. Looks good. Thank you. Okay. So if we think about layering strategically, we want to have our innermost layers be a wicking layer, thin, light fabric that is hydrophobic, that's going to push our body moisture out into our outer layers. Then we need an insulating layer which would have high pile to it um, and be also a wicking material that is hydrophobic that's going to allow that body heat to travel outwards. And it sounds counterintuitive to let our body heat out. It's more that it's letting our body moisture out and staying dry so it retains our body heat. Um, so wool we'll polar fleece down, again, be careful with down. And then the outermost layer is going to be um, our protecting our cocoon that we've created this nice little um, airy cocoon that we're that we're hunkered down inside of, um, and that's going to keep the wind and the moisture from coming in from the outside. So we want to trap our body heat, but not our body moisture. And sometimes you'll see people out cross country skiing or on a chopping wood, high activity, and they've got on, you know, their long underwear, their insulating layer, their wool jacket over the top of it, and they're covered in frost on the outside. That's their body heat, their body moisture coming out and just freezing on that outside layer. And you can brush it off and everything's warm and dry inside. So um, again, knowing what your conditions are. So if you're wearing a real loose weave wool sweater, this sweater will not be good in wind. It's got lots of holes in it. It's got lots of, lots of um, places for the wind to come through. So I might throw on a nylon shell over this wool, puffy wool sweater um, to keep the wind out. But there again, I wanna make sure that what I am putting on on the outside is not gonna trap my moisture inside my layers. Um, you will see when you start looking around with a new eye for things, you will see good quality gear that has cotton in it as an outer layer. So you may see um, people who do winter camping and canvas tents they frequently will be wearing a cotton canvas anorak over top of everything. Those cotton shells uh, with a really tight weave are really windproof and um, they tend to be traditional, they tend to be more quiet. So people who travel in the woods kind of like that quiet, um, less synthetic, less man-made experience. And so um, you may see a real tight weave cotton outer layer being sold, use it judiciously. Um, know, know your circumstances in your situation. If it's going to be wet, driving rain or uh, snow that's going to stick to you and melt, then, then that can get you into some trouble. Probably not between your car and the grocery store, <laughs> but <laughs> if you're going to be outside for several days, then you want to consider that. Um, so once we have our, our, our layers, now we can adapt those layers to different conditions. So you, I might wear silk long underwear if I'm going to be in a 
40 degree or 30 degree environment for four or five hours. If I'm going to be in a minus 25 degree environment for 14 or 20 hours, I'm going to wear my silk long underwear with a pair of wool long underwear over it and a pair of fleece pants over that, where's my insulation, and then a pair of maybe wool pants on the outside to keep out the wind and the moisture, or just a big pair of puffy snow pants that's going to be a nice thick layer of, of uh, quilted fabric that's gonna keep out the wind and the moisture. Um, and so you need to be able to adapt your layers. And I, I tell people, this is your excuse to buy, to have a lot of good gear. <laughs> Just don't have it all be the same. And then you can justify having a lot of good gear and having several different sweaters you know, or several different uh, fleece jackets or fleece liners that you would put on for different conditions. Um, I just recently learned that the reason cables were knitted into fabric was to create, or were knitted into wool sweaters was to create more loft and more places for air to get trapped in there. And so a cable knit sweater, or like this one that I'm wearing today has lots of cables, lots of different cables and lots of different texture to it. This is a really warm sweater. Um, but it might not be the sweater that I would wear in a 40 degree environment um, that I might wear a flat wool sweater or a real thin wool sweater or, you know, a much, much lighter weight sweater that doesn't have quite all that texture to it. Um, outer layers don't need to be expensive. Uh, when I went on our Iditarod expedition trip, I went to Target and I bought two pair of just ladies um, snow pants. And I got one in the size that I would wear. And then I got another pair that was about two sizes bigger so that if I needed, I could double them up. I could put one pair on over the other and have it be really, really roomy and not tight and constricting because I didn't know what kind of conditions we were going to find out there on the Iditarod Trail. And there were times when I did wear both pairs of snow pants because I was sitting on the back of the snow machine traveling 50 miles at 40 miles an hour. And I wanted wind protection and I wanted a big puffy area around my body that was holding, holding that warm air in. Um, and then, you know, as soon as we stop, pull those layers off because then I was busy and active and I didn't want to trap that moisture inside those layers and have it freeze overnight um, in our tents. So head, hands, and feet can be really problematic for people. And a lot of these issues can be addressed by addressing circulation and by addressing fabric. So if you are wearing gloves, that is going to keep the heat from this finger from warming this finger and vice versa. So if you have mittens, that allows your fingers to warm each other and share circulation. Um, and there are less surface centimeters of surface area um, to allow cold to chill each of your fingers. So mittens are almost always warmer than gloves depending on the situation. Um, there are, like silk long underwear, there are silk glove liners that are fantastic. Real, real lightweight and thin. They're about 15 bucks a pair. And if you've got just that little extra layer in there, it keeps another layer of, of warm, dry air. It, if your fingers and your gloves get at all cold or clammy, then, then you're, you've got the same problems as if you're not wearing gloves. So that thin silk liner, even if the insulation of your hand, your mitten or glove gets a little bit damp, the, the silk will keep a layer of warm, dry air around your skin itself. Um, they make really thin wool liners as well that fit inside gloves and mittens. Um, but there again, I recommend instead of spending $100 on one pair of gloves and expecting that to be your silver bullet, spend $100 on five cheaper pairs of gloves 
and get them on sale. March is coming, people. This is the time to shop for winter clothing. <laughs> this is it. Um, but purchase more pairs of cheaper gear so that you have options to change them out and to, you know, if they start to feel my fingers are a little bit cold, put on a pair of dry gloves and get your other ones all the way dry before you wear them again. So that's kind of a tutorial about hands. Oh, and chemical hand warmers are for the smart, not the weak. So go ahead and get those shake up charcoal hand warmers. But remember, those need oxygen to retain their heat or to maintain temperature. So if you put them inside a pair of mittens or a pair of gloves, if they're tight in there, they're, you're cutting off their um, oxygen supply. So you want them to be, um, you want to be able to kind of keep massaging them to keep oxygen activated inside those little packets that they have. Um, and then you, you'll know how long you've been outside by how dirty your fingernails get because the little charcoal comes out through the packets and turns your fingernails black, but it's worth it because your hands are warm. So uh, the downside of these chemical hand warmers is the ones that are designed for, for feet and boots. And there's two factors there. One is that they need oxygen to stay warm. So you take them, put, you know, shake them up, put them in your boot liner, and then you put your foot on top of it. And basically you're snuffing out its ability to maintain heat. And you're adding another layer inside your boot. And if your boots are not big enough to begin with, you're gonna then compromise your circulation to your feet. So I don't ever use those. I don't recommend them unless you really think your system through, get boots that are big and roomy and that you can maybe, you know, as you lift up your foot, you're lifting up the top of the boot, you might create space underneath where you can kind of shake that warmer and reactivate it, get a little more oxygen into it. Um, so about boots, if you think about your feet always producing a little bit of moisture, where is that moisture going? So if you have a boot that is a solid single entity, and maybe it's got some Sherpa lining on the inside of it, or maybe it's got Thinsulate or you know um, some kind of nylon pile inside there, um, where's your moisture going? Typically it's going into that fabric, and it's not escaping out through the top of the boot and it's not being released. And so it's just accumulating inside the boot. Well, once that heat and that moisture hits the outer layer of the boot, it will condense and create more moisture. And then you have cold clammy feet. And most people, if they wear a size eight shoe, they buy a size eight boot, which would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? to buy clothes that fit you. But my recommendation is to always buy boots that are at least one size, maybe two sizes bigger than you would expect to wear. You should feel movement inside your boot. I personally, if I can't put my foot in the boot and curl my toes all the way under, I wouldn't buy those boots. Maybe for running to the grocery store, but I wouldn't wear them for any extended outdoor time. Um, there's just not enough room in there for me to put on a pair of nice thick socks, wool socks, and still have 100% circulation to my feet and a layer of warm, dry air around my feet. Um, so I highly recommend a pack boot or a layered boot that has a felted wool liner. And I also recommend that you always buy an extra pair of liners so that if you're gonna be outside two days in a row, or if you're gonna be outside for 10 or 12 or 14 hours, that once you start to feel like your feet are maybe getting a little bit damp, you've got dry liners to put in. So on a dog sled race, you know, we'll work for several hours, switch out our liners, put them up on the dashboard and get them really dry so that 10 hours later, when we need to switch them out again, we've got dry liners, um, you know, and the boot dryers. Now you can plug them into a cigarette lighter in the car. And it's a pretty sweet uh, option to get your boot liners completely dry. 
Because there again, if it's a felted wool liner or a, a, a felt liner, you can buy them in different thicknesses. So if you've bought the pack boot, and by pack boot, I mean the kind that have like the rubber sole and the nylon upper, um, Sorel's, Kamex, Baffin boots, these are all brands that probably people are familiar with. Um, and you can get real thin liners for them, or you can get some really thick ones, as long as you're not interfering with the circulation inside your boot, um, you're, you're gonna be better off than if you have a boot with just one layer between you and the outside world that can hold moisture. <clears throat> um, mucklucks, I love mucklucks. However, um, we live in a place where we can end up with an awful lot of salt and sand and slop on our warm winter days. And so I don't recommend mucklucks for running around town um, because you're gonna damage your boots. You're, you're gonna shorten the life of them where if you have a rubber footed boot, um, you know, you can wear it anywhere in any conditions and it's gonna last for, for years and years. So, um, you know, if you're gonna go out on the Bear Grease and spend a couple of days at a wilderness checkpoint um, where there is no salt and sand on the roads, man, I would love to wear my clucks out there. That's gonna be great. Another little secret, um, is that you can purchase a wool um, foot bed to go underneath the liner of your boots. And basically what that does is it adds another layer um, of warm, dry air between your the bottom of your foot and the ground. So you've got the sole of the boot, which on good winter boots will have maybe knobs in it that are good for traction, but also create air space between you and the, and the snow. Um, and then you've got the boot itself, and then you've got space in there generally to put another wool liner in there. And so that's one of my um, secret luxuries is that I buy new wool footbeds for most of my boots um, every couple of years and slip them in. They're all cushy and nice. So wool socks. Um, again, if you buy thin, flat wool socks, that's not going to have the same insulating value as a puffier wool sock. Um, there are some brands out there that are really spendy um, where you might spend 30 or $40 a pair on socks. I don't buy those. They wear holes in them just like the cheaper versions do. Um, and they just, it's, it's simply a matter of marketing. Like there's other brands that are really good wool socks that just are not as well known as some of the big name sock manufacturers. And I, I, find them on sale. I'll buy four or five pair every year um, because as you wear them, your, your body oil gets into them and it does compromise those fibers, but also you kind of crush them down and they get kind of felted. And so after a couple of years, there may be less insulating, less pile to them. Um, and there again, it's another excuse to buy some good gear. So I'm always looking for an excuse to buy good clothing. Any questions on head, hands, and feet? Oh, I haven't talked about heads. Um, any questions on hands and feet at this point? We're doing all right. So about your head, I tend to run hot. And so for me, I tend to wear a hat as the last layer I put on. I'll wear headbands to cover up my ears. Um, and to keep that skin covered and to protect, you know, these, you know, my little ears that might freeze while still allowing body heat to escape because I want to maintain this perfect temperature on my inner, you know, inside my layers where I'm not sweaty, but I'm not cold. So um, I manage that through, uh, head, uh, through my head. Um, and I've been called out on it. You know, people say, oh, you teach lessons, but you don't wear a hat. But well, it's it's strategic. I have I have a system. And for me, um, keeping my head covered is the last thing that I do because it does it does um, keep so much more of my body heat inside my layers. <clears throat> um, about our heads. 
Don't wear jewelry if you're going to be outdoors for extended periods of time. Take out your earrings, take off your rings, don't wear toe rings. All that metal is just conducting cold up into your skin and setting yourself up to have a rough, you know, have, have, have skin be colder than it should be or needs to be. Um, on our Iditarod trip, one of our clients about four days in was saying that her toe was really bothering her and we took off her boot and she had a toe ring on and it had frozen her toe and her poor little toe was just all swelled up and puffy. We couldn't pull the ring off. And it was just a direct result of her having that metal around the base of her toe. Um, which by the way, have you seen that trick where you wrap the dental floss around to get a ring off? One of the guides did that and it worked. I was so impressed. <laughs> I gave him, I gave him extra MacGyver points for being able to get her ring off without chopping her toe off because <laughs> I didn't, wouldn't have known how to do that. Um, so be mindful. You'll see I'm wearing a cotton baseball cap. I'm also, you know, in a place where I can change out my headgear and not, um, not end up with wet cotton up against my head. Okay, any questions on head, hat, head, hands, or feet? No? Well, I'm here. You can always pop in if you come up with a question. Okay, some of my favorite hacks. Okay, we've talked about some of them. Mittens are warmer than gloves. Um, the footbed liners for boots. Oh, I can't say enough about that. That's, <laughs> that, that makes a huge difference. Uh, hand warmers are not for the week. If it keeps moisture out, it keeps moisture in. And then my favorite is put on a scarf. This is another area where we have a lot of exposed skin with a lot of capillaries in it. We can lose a lot of body heat around our neck. Sometimes just putting on a scarf around your neck is as good as putting on a whole nother layer. Um, and you can, you know, stuff it in your pocket if you don't need it. Um, polar fleas, um, some of the nice soft wool. I've seen down scarves, which are pretty, pretty cool. Um, my favorite is just a high quality silk scarf that um, is real thin, but it maintains body heat remarkably well. So that's one of my, another excuse to buy good scarves <laughs> pretty scarves we've got a couple um, questions here okay. what about face coverings and mm -hmm. and then neck gaiters i think in line with the scarves as options um mm -hmm. so, uh, and then there's another one but i'll let you address any face coverings and the neck gaiters okay too. i because i wear glasses i don't use face coverings very much i find that unless they have a lot of place for your moisture your air to your breath to get out you're going to end up with a bigger problem in the long run um, by having that that fabric there holding your breath close to your face um, because your breath is just so full of moisture and so that's where we get into the moisture is your enemy um, air is our friend but not the air we exhale <laughs> i'll put it that way um, also blowing into your mittens and gloves to warm them up, you're just dumping moisture into them as well. So I tend not to wear face coverings. However, uh, if you don't wear glasses where fog is, you know, or fogging up is an issue. If you do wear a face covering, just make sure that you are not trapping moisture in up against your skin. Switching them out to, you know, having lots of options. The other question, is there a way to warm up your hands outdoors once they're cold? Circulation. That's going to be your main factor. Get your body heat going. Chop some wood, sweep a floor. Um, when, you know, with around horses, if I get cold, I go groom a horse because all of this activity is just pumping her, uh, uh, blood out into my extremities get your heart rate up is going to be a really, and, and there again, we, we tend to go, I'm freezing cold. And so we huddle up, we, you know, get smaller instead of getting more active. Um, 
once they're cold, changing your mittens, getting some a heat source inside your mittens with a hand warmer. <clears throat> but really your circulation is the most important thing you can do. But also ask the question, are my mittens wet? Are my gloves damp? Because changing into dry gloves, getting your heart rate up, um, those are all things that then you can do. Um, people don't think about moisture because they, they're cold so they don't think they're sweating. And so we don't tend to think about moisture as a source of cold when we're, when we're in trouble. There now circulation may be an issue as well. The older I get, the shorter amount of time I can be out like filling my bird feeders in just thin leather gloves. Um, I notice that my fingers are getting colder faster, and, which is alarming to me because I love to be outdoors in the wintertime and I, I, it is of concern to me how quickly my fingers are starting to feel like they're really uncomfortably cold. I think it's really important. Americans don't talk about chillblain and chillblains are tissue damage from cold and reheating. It's very common in England where they don't have a, you know, they don't have a ton of really good Arctic gear. Um, but chillblains is tissue damage from cold, but not freezing. And it tends to be from being really, really cold and wet and then heating, reheating too fast. So um, if you do get really, really cold hands and feet, um, your, uh, well, your armpits are very, you know, it's a nice neutral 98 degree area where you can stick your hands. I'm probably not gonna work for your feet unless you're good at yoga, but um, getting your hands into your armpits can, can help you warm up slowly, but you do want to be careful about reheating too fast. And the other thing about hand warmers is that they can make your hands sweaty. So just pay attention to that, that you don't want, you don't want to be damp. Any other, As yeah, go ahead. That, Julia, it made me wonder too um, about skincare in general, like uh, lotion for your hands. I just put on chapstick. Mm -hmm. um, are, are there things like that that can help you before you even get your layers on? Well, I go back and forth on that. I'm a lotion person. I wear, you know, I put on hand lotion every time I wash my hands. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't know of any products that will help protect us in the cold. Um, my mom was telling me about something that's being marketed that it like seals your moisture in and it's supposed to keep you warmer. And that just, that makes my red flags fly. I don't know. I don't know the science behind that and I don't really believe it. <laughs> so take that for what it's worth. But, um, I, I, Here's what I do know. Maintaining good circulation and wearing good materials and staying dry has been working for keeping people warm for millennia. <laughs> so Johnson and Johnson making the magic potion that is going to make those other things null and void. I'm pretty skeptical about, about stuff like that. So, um, I think that, you know, from a comfort perspective, having pliable skin is good, you know, and the, you know, the cold chapping, chapping, chap skin tends to come from moisture. So, um, you know, that can make you more comfortable, but I don't know of any products that will necessarily keep you warmer or safer. There was <laughs> one mentioned in the chat of hmm. warm skin. That was okay. um, used by Anne Bancroft on her article. Okay. I wasn't sure if that was one in particular you were familiar with or not, but um, I'm not. Okay. I'm not familiar with that. I should look into it because you know Anne Bancroft is not just some ding dong that doesn't know anything about coal. So if she's saying that it makes a difference, I would want to look into it. But I'd want to understand the physics of it and the science of it um, before I make a. At, you know, before I um, uh, advocate for that. Um, okay, so finally, we need to adapt to our conditions. 
Okay, we live in a place where it can be 60 degrees warmer a couple days later in the winter time. And there's a big difference between 40 below and 20 above. That's the same as between 20 and 80 when you stop and do the math, right? The thermometer math. So we need to have different layers for different activities and different conditions. If we're getting a warm, wet snow, we don't want to wear the same stuff that we would wear or the same number of layers that we might wear when it's 40 degrees below zero and dry. Um, and so we need to have a plan. This goes back to that staying warm is better than trying to get warm after you're cold. So we need to have a plan. I'm going to be outside today. I'm going to take along, you know, my snow pants and my wool pants and extra wool socks that I can change six hours into my day. And I'm going to have, you know, different layers inside my bag so that as I'm increasing my activity, I'm pulling layers off. Um, you know, as I'm getting ready to ride the horse, I'm going to ride for the two hours that I'm going to ride. I need to be dressed for riding, which is sedentary. But before I'm on the horse, I'm grooming and saddling the horse, which is active. So I'm pulling off layers to get ready. Or maybe if you're pitching a tent, maybe if you're splitting wood, maybe if you're going skiing, you need your layers off so that your increased activity, increased heat is being released and your inner layers are staying as dry as they can. And then as you start to slow your activity down, you need to be putting on layers preemptively before you get cold and putting on dry layers. You know, if you've been wearing layers all morning and you've been kind of active and then you're gonna switch them out, get some dry stuff to put on. Um, and so understanding what is the temperature, what is the, environmental moisture like? Is it humid? Um, as the temperatures have come up in the past three days, two days, the barn that I'm spending my time in has gotten more and more humid. So I'm wearing different layers today than I wore on the first day when it was 10 degrees inside the barn. Now it's 40 degrees inside the barn, but it's much more humid. And we can get into more trouble at 40 degrees than we typically do at 10 below, because at 40, we're thinking it's not that cold. And you can get into hypothermia, you can get into dampness that you're not managing because the thermometer says 40, even though your body temperature is coming down and down and down, and you're approaching hypothermia, or you're getting yourself into a situation where you might not be able to recover and maintain the activity that you're trying to do outdoors for an extended period of time. So knowing your environment, knowing your activity, knowing your clothing and your gear, and then, um, then you can just kind of mix and match your layers. You're not going to have one system for all activities. So I would wear something very different to go ice fishing than I would to go dog sledding. So, and then of course, extreme temperatures. Um, you know, when we were on our Iditarod trip, our daytime highs were maybe 30 below. Um, there were a couple of days where we had to wait until well afternoon because we couldn't run. The, it was just too, too cold to start running the dogs. Um, and so we had to wait for those temperatures to come up to 25, 30 below before we could um, start running them. Our, therm our thermometers quit at 49 degrees below zero. So we don't know how cold it got. It was only nine o'clock at night when it was 49 below. So I have to assume it was colder than that. Um, and that was then when two pairs of snow pants, I was wearing my good long underwear, my extra layers, my wool sweater, my turtlenecks to, you know, so that I wasn't dealing with scarves. I was, you know, up to here, hat, jacket, down layer, and then a giant parka over all of it. You know, I looked like this crazy little weevil, but I was warm inside that little cocoon. Um, even when it was, I don't know how far below zero. So finally, I want to talk about where to get stuff. Once you know what you're looking for, right? So you're looking for wool sweaters. You're looking for um, wool sweaters with high pile. You're looking for, um, you know, name brand clothing maybe that you don't want to pay full price for because if you're going to be wearing it outdoors, 
uh, you know, it may get ripped. It may get, it may get damaged or dirty. Um, thrift stores are a fantastic place to look for stuff. And if you find something, um, try and play it cool so that they don't raise the price on you before you get to the <laughs> checkout. <laughs> you don't want to go, oh, my God, my lace jacket for $10. Um, but once you know what you're looking for, then you can find it in a lot of places. Um, surplus stores, gear stores will have outlet sales or have return sales. REI um, has a return um, sale where people buy stuff and then they sell the, they sell it at return prices. That's a way to get a, a break on some of the bigger name brand gear. I have found that a lot of the cost of name brand clothing is about the name brand. I'm not saying it's not good quality gear, um, but, um, and you know, Patagonia, I believe it's Patagonia has a, you know, a repair or replace policy that is fantastic, which is great for an adult who's done growing, but I would never buy a Patagonia snow pants for my kids growing up because they're gonna outgrow them before those pants. Um, are not useful any longer. So you can, you can find stuff, read the tags. If there's no cotton in it, if it's got, you know, nylon and spandex and it's really a squishy, you know, stretchy shirt. If I, one of my favorite finds um, was at Kohl's in June, I found this real thin, really stretchy cashmere sweater that now is part of my long underwear um, gear. Um, because it's this real thin wool layer that's real stretchy. It doesn't constrict me at all. And so, and I think I got it for five bucks because it was June <laughs> and they wanted to get rid of their stuff. So um, the coming into spring and summer, that's the time to look at those sale racks and, and um, just keep an eye out, make a list. I keep a list in my wallet of what I, what's on my list that I'm not going to buy new um, buying gloves and socks at this point in the year is, you know, you're going to find a lot of stuff on sale. You might be able to find, you know, $30 gloves for 10 bucks a pair, buy more than one pair so that you always have something dry to put on. SarahTradingPost.com is a factory seconds type, uh, of, um, clearing house, and they frequently have really good prices on wool socks. So that's where I buy my wool socks and I buy them in, in, in mass. Uh, Campmore.com is also a, a good online um, uh, website that has a lot of gear um, and you can kind of keep an eye on their sale pages. Here's a little hack for um, Sierra Trading Post. When you go to their website, they'll say, hey, do you want 20% off your order? Give us your email address. Give them your email address, then unsubscribe. And then the next time you log into their website, they'll say, hey, do you want 25% off your first order? They go, well, don't mind if I do. And give, them their, give them your email address. So that's kind of one way where you can get um, some discounts, you know, by trading your email address. And then you can always unsubscribe. So uh, that's, that's just a little hack. But if you are going to thrift stores, keep an eye out. Land's End, Eddie Bauer. Cabela's, North Face, REI, Outdoor Research, Marmot, Patagonia. Those are, they're, it's quality gear. It's built well. I'm not going to say it's not. Um, but you can find off-brand down jackets that are still very well built for a percentage of the price um, if, you, if you know what to look for and you're, and you're looking at, uh, at discount places. All right. That's all I have. I wonder if there's any questions from anybody. There's a question in the chat about your thoughts okay. on zippered vents and shock cord adjusters, other unique ways to vent your outer outer materials um, mm -hmm. and materials itself, like the Gore-Tex. Mm -hmm. um, so the zippered vents, that's always a smart plan. You know, it gives you a, a way to either have an opening or a closing in your jacket. I, like I said, I tend to run hot. And so any of the Gore-Tex, Suplex, Ultrex, those kinds of fabrics, I just feel cold and damp inside them, no matter what my layers are on in, in inside. So um, 
I, I don't care for them. I don't own them. I did go through an evolution where I was um, coming into this. I was hearing about all this tech gear. I was looking, you know, trying all these tech fabrics and stuff. And then I went to wool and <laughs> it was embarrassing because you would have thought I had invented something new. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, this, these wool pants are the best things I've ever put on over my other layers. Uh, you know, and it was like I was discovering something new that you know has been around forever. So I tend to go with wool and natural fibers much more than um, the synthetics. And even, you know, I, I've got a couple wool sweaters that I got at the men's part um, department or men's side of the of a thrift store. So I got them really big. I washed them and dried them, a, you know, a little bit to kind of felt them down and shrink them a little bit. So they got real dense. And so those are my outer layers when I'm at the barn or when I'm out on a dog sled race. Those are the outer layers that I wear because they do kind of keep the wind and the rain off or the moisture off because they're so dense. So I'm not, I don't love the, the tech gear. You can dump a ton of money into gear that it's not conducive to active outdoor um, living. And yeah, I noticed your comment about the gear exchange, that there's good stuff there, really good stuff there. And if you know what you're looking for, um, you can find some great products there. Um, oh, shock cord adjusters. I just had my, a good friend of mine brought his son up to uh, go out on the Bear Grease, uh, to see the start of the Bear Grease Marathon this last weekend. And we got back into the car after we'd been out for about 45 minutes and this kid took off his gloves and his hands were ice cold. And I'm like, <gasps> what is wrong with your hands? And I pulled up his sleeve and he had pulled, he had a shot cord and he had pulled it so tight that it had cut off the circulation to his hands. So if you're dealing with children, pay attention to that. There's a sweet spot of tightness <laughs> that will keep the snow out, but still allow the circulation. And, you know, this kid has a sensory um, processing issues. And so for him, tighter feels better, but, you know, here he's wearing $60 gloves and they're, they're wet inside and he's got his circulation cut off. So it, it would pay really close attention to kids stuff. I tend to, as a mom, I would just buy tons of mittens and gloves on sale at the end of the year for the next year and just have them keep switching them out because that was still better than having them have expensive gear that inevitably they would leave on the school bus. So, and only one of them. <laughs> Somebody else couldn't even make use of them because they only had one good mitten. Well, I've got another question about going to the bathroom. I have heard that your body uses a lot of energy to keep liquid warm. So if you are walking around with extra liquid in your body and you haven't gotten rid of it somehow, are you potentially losing energy or getting colder by not going to the bathroom outside? Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Um, I don't know the science behind that, but I do know that um, the, that is that is something that we practiced in winter camping is go to the bathroom. Don't don't and and like I said, I don't know the science behind it. I've heard that for years that it's a it's a waste of energy, maybe more than you're you're not going to be like oh, I just peed and now I'm so warm. It's not going to be that obvious, but it's one of these things that's kind of just chipping away, you know, at your overall ability to maintain heat. And so, you know, it, it's something to kind of keep up on, you know, or if you have to go to the bathroom, you're not going to get frostbite because you didn't pee. So I, I do, I have heard that and I have practiced that um, for many years. So I say yes.
Anything else? Also, um, it, winter camping, uh, having a piece of hard candy can give you like a quick little boost to help you maybe bridge a point where you're thinking, I'm maybe dangerously cold or I'm approaching dangerously cold. Um, having some candy, some chocolate, something that goes in. I have had the experience of waking up in the night inside my sleeping bag, feeling too cold, having to go to the bathroom and you don't wanna get out and go to the bathroom because you already feel cold. Popping in a Jolly Rancher, putting in a, a Hershey's Kiss, um, and then uh, laying there and just feeling the heat, of, taking a drink of water also, feeling the heat just start to generate from within me. And it was almost like turning up a thermostat. It was really strange. Um, but it was a great demonstration that, you know, a little bit of sugar, um, a little bit of liquid can really help kind of jumpstart your inner furnace. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, I sure appreciate you joining in today. I hope you've taken something that will make you more comfortable in the winter time. Thank you so much for offering these tips, Julie. I, I certainly, I certainly learned something, a number of things, and appreciated right. all the information. Um, again, thanks for everyone who joined us today. If you, if you joined us without registering for the link, I'd encourage you to still go back and register so that you're entered in to win those prizes at the end of our week of Winter Bike Week. Um, and please join us for those, those other events if you're able to as well. But um, thanks again to Julie. This was wonderful. Um, stay warm. Have a great time with the rest of the session that you have going on. Will do. And I'm on my way afternoon. back to the barn. Thank yeah, you. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Get outside and play. <laughs>